Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'll be making a start on my review of World War Z, An Oral History of the Zombie War by Max Brooks, who also wrote the Zombie Survival Guide, which I have read. Um, and so basically this, again, it's like a zombie apocalypse, post-apocalypse novel, except as it's, you know, you get from the subtitle of, of it being an oral history, it's very much comprised of things like interviews and transcripts and things like that. I'm going to read you the blurb here. It began with rumours from China about another pandemic. Then the cases started to multiply, and what had looked like the stirrings of a criminal underclass, even the beginnings of a revolution, soon revealed itself to be much, much worse. Faced with a future of mindless, man-eating horror, humanity was forced to accept the logic of world government and face events that tested our sanity and our sense of reality. Max Brooks lives in New York City, but is ready to move to a more remote and defensible location at a moment's notice. His zombie survival guide was adopted as a required text by all of the world's basic military trading programs during the recent global conflict. And so, I don't know, I'm not necessarily a fan of books that are like this anyway. Um, I guess like epistolary novels, that kind of thing. I did like Dracula, I think that did it quite well. Here, it got kind of annoying at times. There's not really a central narrative as well. So, it's very unlike the Hollywood film. This is basically all world building without any real narrative holding it together. I mean, it made it interesting, especially if you're into zombie stuff. But it was kind of more interesting as, you know, analysing a primary source that... Is, is like, you know, watching The Walking Dead or something. It's quite an important part of popular culture. So I kind of got my enjoyment from that as opposed to from the actual book itself. But I did like to see some of, like, Brooks's ideas about what would happen as well. So I'm going to go through and look at some of my tabs here. So I thought this was quite interesting here. Uh, one of the transcripts goes, Do you understand the economics? I mean, big-time pre-war global capitalism. Do you get how it worked? I don't, and anyone who says they do is full of shit. There are no rules, no scientific absolutes. You win, you lose, it's a total crapshoot. The only rule that ever made sense to me I learned from a history, not an economics, professor at Wharton. Fear, he used to say. Fear is the most valuable commodity in the universe. That blew me away. Turn on the TV, he'd say. What are you seeing? People selling their products? No. People selling the fear of you having to live without their products. Fucking A, was he right. Fear of ageing, fear of loneliness, fear of poverty, fear of failure. Fear is the most basic emotion we have. Fear is primal. Fear sells. That was my mantra. Fear sells. This reference kind of dates it here. Let's see. Yeah, so uh, this edition first published in 2013. The initial copyright was 2006. And even then, this feels a little dated. Uh, so somebody gets asked, what about the internet? What about it? For me, it was shopping. For Jenna, it was homework. For Tim, it was stuff he kept swearing he'd never look at again. The only news I ever saw was what popped up on my AOL welcome page. Don't even know if AOL is still in business. I, uh, I thought this was interesting as well. Obviously, these are all from transcripts, so I, I don't really think there's that much point me going into who's telling them because it almost doesn't really matter, you know? But, um, yeah, brilliance, sheer fucking brilliance. Conventional executions might have reinforced discipline, might have restored order from the top down, but by making us all accomplices, they held us together not just by fear, but by guilt as well. We could have said no, could have refused and been shot ourselves, but we didn't. We went right along with it. We all made a conscious choice and because that choice carried such a high price, I don't think anyone ever wanted to make another one again. We, relin we relinquished our freedom that day and we were more than happy to see it go. From that moment on we lived in true freedom. The freedom to point to someone else and say, they told me to do it, it's their fault, not mine. The freedom, God help us, to say, I was only following orders. And a soldier's given his testimony here, he says, we could have stopped them, we should have. One guy with a rifle, that's all you need, right? Professional soldiers, trained marksmen, how could they get through? They still ask that, critics and armchair patterns who weren't there. You think it's that simple? You think that after being trained to aim for the centre mass your whole military career, you can suddenly make an expert headshot every time? You think in that straitjacket and suffocation hood it's easy to recharge a clip or clear a weapon jam? You think that after watching all the wonders of modern warfare fall flat on the high-tech hyper-ass, that, that after already living through three months of the Great Panic and watching everything you knew as reality be eaten alive by an enemy that wasn't even supposed to exist, that you're going to keep a f cool fucking head and a steady fucking trigger finger? I thought this little bit here was quite cool. Um, I mean, cool. Obviously disturbing, but cool as well. The harbour was choked with corpses, but corpses that were still moving. We'd blasted them into the harbour with anti-riot water cannons. It saved ammo and it helped to keep the streets clear. It was a good idea until the pressure in the hydrants died. We'd lost our commanding officer two days earlier. Freak accident. One of our men had shot a zombie that was almost on top of him. The bullet had gone right through the creature's head, taking bits of diseased brain tissue out the other end and into the colonel's shoulder. Insane, eh? He turned over sector command to me before dying. 
my first official duty was to put him down. I thought this here was quite telling in terms of the mental toll it would take on you to keep shooting zombies. That was another thing they taught us at Willow Creek. Don't write their eulogy, don't try to imagine who they used to be, how they came to be here, how they came to be this. I know, who doesn't do that, right? Who doesn't look at one of those things and just naturally start to wonder? It's like reading the last page of a book, your imagine just naturally spinning. And that's when you get distracted, get sloppy, let your guard down and end up leaving someone else to wonder what happened to you. I tried to put her, it, out of my mind. Instead, I found myself wondering why it had been the only one I'd seen. All right, we've switched to this unusual angle because I don't know where my tripod is. So I have a few last little bits here that I want to mention from World War Z. So I thought this was an interesting little paragraph here. We were the first ones to discover zombie holes, the pits that the undead dig when they're going after burrowing animals. At first we thought they were just isolated incidents until we noticed that they were spreading all over the world. Sometimes more than one would appear in close proximity to the next. There was a field in southern England. I guess there must have been a high concentration of rabbits. That was just riddled with holes, all different depths and sizes. Many of them had large dark stains around them. Although we couldn't zoom in close enough, we were pretty sure it was blood. For me that was the most terrifying example of our enemy's drive. They displayed no conscious thought, just sheer biological instinct. I once watched a Zed head go after something, probably a golden mole, in the Namib desert. The mole had burrowed deep in the slope of a dune. As the ghoul tried to go after it, the sand kept pouring down and filling the hole. The ghoul didn't stop, didn't react in any way, it just kept going. I watched it for five days, the fuzzy image of this G digging and digging and digging, then suddenly one morning just stopping, getting up and shuffling away as if nothing had happened. It must have lost the scent. Good on the mole. We have a reference to a very, very good book here. Um, Did you ever read All Quiet on the Western Front? Remark paints a vivid picture of Germany becoming empty, meaning that toward the end of the war, they were simply running out of soldiers. You can fudge the numbers, send the old men and little boys, but eventually you're going to hit the ceiling. Unless every time you killed an enemy, he came back to life on your side. That's how Zack operated, Zack being the way they refer to the zombies. Swelling his ranks by thinning ours. And it only worked one way. Infect a human, he becomes a zombie. Kill a zombie, he becomes a corpse. We could only get weaker, while they might actually get stronger. I thought this was quite sad as well. I lived a block away from a pet store. I used to drive by it every day on my way to work, confounded by how these sentimental, socially incompetent losers could shell out so much money on oversized barking hamsters. During the panic, the dead started to collect around that pet shop. I don't know where the owner was. He'd pulled down the gates but left the animals inside. I could hear them from my bedroom window. All day, all night. Just puppies, you know, a couple of weeks old. Scared little babies screaming for their mummies, for anyone to please come and save them. I heard them die one by one as their water bottles ran out. The dead never got in. They were still massed outside the gate when I escaped, ran right past without stopping to look. What could I have done? I was unarmed, untrained. I couldn't have taken care of them. I could barely take care of myself. What could I have done? Something. Could have done something. And this is interesting how the men in the army deal with bites. The logical alternative, the only one, was to therefore let the boys commit the act themselves. I can still remember their faces, dirty and pimply, their red rimmed eyes wide as they closed their mouths around their rifles. What else could be done? It wasn't long before they began to kill themselves in groups, all those who'd been bitten in a battle gathering at the field hospital to synchronise the moment when they would all pull the trigger. I guess it was comforting knowing that they weren't dying alone. It was probably the only comfort they could expect. They certainly didn't get it from me. And um, some of the, obviously then some religious people are like, well, suicide is a sin. And so, yeah, it's interesting the way that they deal with it, you know. I thought these couple of paragraphs here were worth noting as well. Um, the kind of the clean up afterwards. Sickness was a big one. The kinds of diseases that were supposed to be gone, like in the dark ages or something. Yeah, we took our pills, had our shots, ate well, and had regular checkups, but there was just so much shit everywhere. In the dirt, the water, in the rain, and the air we breathed. Every time we entered a city or liberated a zone, at least one guy would be gone, if not dead, then removed for quarantine. In Detroit, we lost a whole platoon to Spanish flu. Brass really freaked on that one, quarantined the whole battalion for two weeks. Then there were mines and booby traps, some civilians, some laid during our bug out west. Made a lot of sense back then. Just seed mile after mile and wait for Zack to blow himself up. Only problem is, mines don't work that way. They don't blow up a human body, they take off a leg or ankle or the family jewels. That's what they're designed for, not to kill people, but to wound them so the army will spend valuable resources keeping them alive, and then send them home in a wheelchair so Ma and Pa civilian can be reminded every time they see him that maybe supporting this war isn't such a good idea. But Zack has no home, no Ma and Pa civilian. All conventional mines do is create a bunch of crippled ghouls that, if anything, 
just makes your job that much harder because you want them upright and easy to spot, not crawling around the weeds waiting to be stepped on like landmines themselves. So yeah, that's about all I wanted to highlight from World War Z, an oral history of the zombie war. I mean, it's not kidding when it calls itself an oral history, it is basically just transcripts. And so especially towards the end, it started to wear for me, I think. Could have been 50 fewer pages, you know. And it does sort of have a plot in that it chronicles the zombie apocalypse, I guess. But it certainly doesn't feel like there's a plot a lot of the time. And there aren't really, like, consistent characters that you can identify with. Um, it's more world-building rather than anything else. But yeah, it was alright for what it was. I gave it a 3.25 out of 5. So there we have it. That's what I thought of World War Z, an oral history of the zombie war by Max Brooks. Are you a zombie cat? Cat? Un chat zombie. More vivant. That's how you say living dead, actually, in French. Uh, yeah, more vivant. Un chat more vivant. So yeah, there we have it. That's what I thought of World War Z and Aura History of the Zombie War by Max Brooks. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.